Hi, everybody. This is Joe Gigworks, CEO of Gigworks. Gigworks, going into its 20th year, be it its services division or our SaaS offering and project ready, as a culture and as a community, we've always been really fixated on just candid talk about technology, its application to business, and have a real passion for this. So today we're kicking off the first in our podcast series, uh, which is about, with all the choices that Microsoft offers you in the cloud to store content, be it OneDrive, SharePoint, Teams, or Azure Blob Storage, when do you want to use which? What has the best value? What is the user experience that drives the right platform to store that content? in a way to just make sense for end users. So today we're gonna to have a conversation with Christian Holzlin. Uh, Christian and I have worked together for 15 years at GigWorks. He's our enterprise architect. And with that, a candid conversation about when to use and why the various options that Microsoft provides. Uh, we always have clients uh, asking us questions about uh, what to use in the way of the many choices that exist in uh, the Microsoft uh, cloud storage environment. Uh, there's SharePoint, there's OneDrive, there's Teams, there's Azure Blob Storage now, which is pretty exciting, and I'd like to know more about that. But uh, the questions we always get are, when would you use it, for what purposes? And of course, there are challenges around that as well, as to <laughs> the challenges around InfoSec, one or the other, or the same, and um, uh, governance, and of course, price. So those are three big drivers. But even then, uh, the fourth and most important driver of adoption is always about the end user experience um, and how we can address that. Uh, we'll talk about later as to how Nintex can help uh, wrap around uh, those different repositories to create seamless environments. So with that, Christian? Right, and you, and you know, user experience really is the ultimate end goals. You want to provide the best user experience for end users, and you don't want to have to be cost burdened by choosing the wrong option, either for the type of content you're storing, and make sure that things are accessible and usable for the applications that are that are integrated with them. You know, classic example of this is your your you know network file shares. You know, a lot of people don't really know what to do with those, and you have a lot of choices in cloud content storage. You know, you've got your SharePoint Online system, you've got your OneDrive, you've got Teams and channels that you can create for. Uh, team-based storage, and you also have what's sort of new kit on the block, which is the Azure Blob Storage or Azure Files, which a lot of people are starting to get um, get interested in. Um, and so basically, you want to decide between what type of user experience you're, you're looking to have. Are you, you know, is the content personal? Is the content structured for a small group of people? What's your audience? You know, you always want to start and think and look at what your audience is. Um, and for a network file share and things like that, you know, what you're probably storing is you're probably storing team files that are worked on by groups of people, and you're probably storing people's personal file shares. And so there are two real easy solutions for that. OneDrive is a great option because it gives people the flexibility to interact with their files directly on their desktop. It integrates with uh, Windows. So, you know, if you're using Intune to roll out desktops, you can wire that into the OS and they're up and running right away, and you can migrate that content very easily with an automation system like Vintex on the back end and just seamlessly pick it up and move it. And then it becomes transparently available for them. They don't have to do anything. You're just basically getting rid of that old file share, and now they're in OneDrive, and all that stuff is in their, in their OneDrive storage. What's nice about that is you get a whole terabyte for that one person, so you don't really have to think about, are they gonna use, are they gonna run out of space? You know, those expensive on-prem file shares can be... Yeah, but I, I have a question, be, though. I mean, be so costly. Was, but OneDrive, one of the things that always bothered me about OneDrive, right? Um, for one, I just find OneDrive tends to be... Um, I, I understand some of its facility, but it, it, it is much more difficult to govern. You have the whole share with thing. Uh, collaboration right. on that content and is not a guarantee. Correct. Uh, so right. between that and governance, and also, you know, nobody likes to formally structure content, but sometimes, you know, you do path of least resistance. But I also always thought that OneDrive represented um, a breakdown of coherent uh, DMS taxonomy and that people are going to start file folders all over the place. So I get it for personal use, but, you know, um, 
uh, outside of personal use, what, what, what use does it have institutionally and how do you address the governance of it? Everything from how they're sharing that stuff out uh, to uh, if that member of your organization is exited, uh, how do you get all that data back in a way that makes sense? Right, and those are good questions. And that's something you also want to consider when you have the other options that you have at your disposal. You know, OneDrive is perfect for giving somebody the opportunity to have a private working area for documents. It's not structured. It's, it's governed in the sense that it's part of your company's data plan. It's sitting in Office 365. So you as the administrator of the tenant can govern access to it. But the intention of OneDrive is not that it's structured or governed. It's that it belongs to a particular employee and they're using it for their working copies. They're putting you know, photos from their phone. You don't know and you don't care. And that's the point of OneDrive. There's so gotcha. much storage space there per user. You can say, you know, we don't have to sit and figure out how much, you know, sand storage space we have to buy and whether or not we want to spend. So it is you know, most. Half so then it's fair to say it's most appropriate for, our for, that, for that personal drive from Windows 95, the My Computer Drive. Uh, but past that, it's really mm -hmm. not an institutional facility for storage and management of content. Is that fair? No, that, that's that's a fair assumption. And and the the niche that it solves is a lot of people struggle right now with what do you do with your legacy file shares, right? Where do you put them? And that's why we're having this discussion. OneDrive is an option for those personal files. You know, everybody has their S drive or their U drive or their T drive, right? That you walk around the office and people refer to it by name and everyone knows what it is because that's what people are used to because that's been a de facto for so long, right? Right, 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 right. So that's the intention of OneDrive is to take that term, that sort of idea, and replace it with, oh, it's on my OneDrive. And the and advantages then, of it are that it is governable, uh, mm -hmm. through Active Directory, like, right. and if that person bounces, and if you have the rights, you can search all that. You can run e-discovery, right? All those tools That's right. still exactly. work over those things. You don't have to get into somebody's local machine. Right. And people and your, your employees can rest assured that their content is, is private only to them. And of course, the administrators yeah, with of the institution, of which would caveat right, knowledge, exactly. Right. But they, you know, it gives people that 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 peace of mind that oh, this is my folder, this is my stuff. I don't have to worry about running out of space. You don't have to worry about running out of space because right. very unlikely that they're going to eat up an entire terabyte of, of file shares. I have, you know, what I've I have seen, my own, and it's almost impossible. <laughs> and what I've seen a lot of institutions go for that I think is problematic. Is they go, well, it's one drive. I can stick a terabyte and folders in it, and they're making it an institutional storage area. Which, uh, to your point, unless you're using it as a one-off, just for legacy stuff, you didn't know what to do with. Um, that's probably not the best way to go. Is that fair? You're you're right. That's actually that's actually the case. Which which sort of dovetails into why Azure Blob Storage and the whole Azure Files component to this cloud content really came about. There's there's a need to store and to access large files that you need to park somewhere that you don't want to pay a lot of money to park, but you need them. And they're large and you don't want to sit around and wait forever to upload it into a SharePoint document library. So, you know, user experience being king, if you have a recordings library, which, you know, a lot of media companies do these days, a lot of content creators have this stuff and they struggle with these, with these issues. You can Go out to right, because it's not and, personal data. It's not necessarily mm -hmm. highly structured data, but it's exactly. institutional knowledge you want to retain. Right, and it's valuable institutional knowledge. And a lot of times, this kind of stuff is is core company collateral, like right. like uh, you know marketing videos or or content that you produce for your customers. Right, and what do you do with a you know what do you do with a five hundred meg you know, MPEG file, you know, you sit there and wait for it to upload at, at two megs a second into a document library? No. Plus, you're paying a premium for the SharePoint online stores. You want to use that for right, so your better highly spend. collaborative structured content where you can control the UX more effectively. Azure Blob Storage and Azure Files gives you the opportunity to say, I need a bunch of terabytes and Microsoft gives them to you at the lowest possible cost for all of their storage options. And you can access it like a file share over a UNC path. And it's yeah, actually and an I, Azure. And if I can pick that up, that, so um, I've been 
involved in multimedia my whole life as well. And one of the things that doesn't work out of SharePoint um, are any file types that have a UNC or an SMB mm -hmm. protocol. Right. So uh, if you're a media company and you have Photoshop files, Adobe Premiere files, they're not going to run out of SharePoint, but they will out of blob storage, correct? And likewise, AEC stuff, architecture and engineering documents like Navisworks or Bentley MicroStation, they would work out of blob storage as well? That's exactly the point. And that's why Azure Files exist. It's to give those heavy-duty applications, applications <laughs> rather, that use these large files that have, that are either streamed or they're very database-like, like a Revit file, which can right. be, you know, several gigs, right? And you have multiple collaborators working on it, and people are editing different sections of that file. That doesn't work over OneDrive, Teams, SharePoint Online. It just doesn't. Those right. tools weren't designed for it. Also, Essentially, it's the missing piece from cloud storage ha is, in fact, Azure Blob Storage. That's, that's, that's really sort of the, 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 the last, like, oh, hey, now we have everything. Got it. It, is, it really is the last piece. And the, the other thing that, that isn't obvious until you've booted it up and, you, and it becomes obvious to you is the bandwidth speed. When you're uploading content into SharePoint, when you're uploading content into Teams, and you're using that nice structured co-authoring support with versioning, and you're working on Office documents, your transactions from the server are very small. They're you know, they're on the order of kilobytes, not megabytes. And so the fact that the upload speed is is a lot lower in places like Teams and SharePoint is fine when you're working on an Office document. And you don't really notice. But when you try to put a, you know, if you try to put a backup of a DVD, you know, let's say you, you're, you, you're a ad agency you know, and you shot a commercial spot for, you know, a, a, a large beverage company, and you have that on a DVD, where, where are you going to store that, right? Right. You're going to go to Azure Files, because you're going to take that file, and you're going to use your high-end internet connection, and Azure Files is going to let you upload that file almost as fast as your internet connection is. So you can get that file up into an encrypted protected file share in the cloud in a very short order. And that's the intention of it. Uh, and if I can, that, just two, that two other questions about Azure Blob Storage. For one, can you extend the search that uh, Microsoft Cloud uh, offers you to surface that information? Um, and and uh, again, a sort of governance question um, in terms of the ability to apply security and rights. Uh, so those, those are two questions. How would you search that mm -hmm. stuff? And how do you govern it? Well, that's an interesting question. In theory, you should be able to search it, but the intention is not really that it's it's searchable content. The the, the point is for that it's it's really supposed to be archived. Um, it's supposed to be long term storage. They have multiple or active tiers, storage, hot or cold. S and B and UNC, right? Right. It could be active uh, content. Well, it it could it very well could be yeah, and it runs over the SMB 3.0 protocol, which is you know it's encrypted. So, and the other thing is you can create multiple file shares inside of Azure files that have different credentials anyway. So you can create protected areas that just aren't accessible to certain users. So gotcha. you you can you can govern it right now, um, but the intention for that area is that it's not really supposed to be. You know, it, it, you're not going to run e-discovery on a Revit model or a DVD, right? It's not the well, whole point of that storage that. technology is that it's it's you know you, you're not you're not doing that, right? That's where well, teams but actually come in. Oh, exactly. Thank you, because that that's what I was thinking. That if it's a working draft, it's a working draft. But if if you want it for compliance purposes, let's take the example from the engineering sector, and this is now an as-built. It's being handed off uh, to the client. That you would bring into SharePoint, right? And and well, yeah, and and that is that is the point of having SharePoint online as what we always recommend as a system of record. The reason why SharePoint online and the reason why SharePoint in general has been such a dominant content management system in the marketplace for I'm I'm looking at the calendar now. What has it been? 
15 years or so, I mean, we're talking a very long time, is because the UX is configurable to meet the needs of any type of team across the entire world in any sector, in any industry that does anything with, with electronic data, right? Which is both its, you know, its, its, its benefit and its pain. You can shape it into whatever you need it to be. But after you've done that, you can also apply policies to the libraries for the content. You can um, add taxonomy and filtering and metadata, and you can organize and build out highly structured, easily accessible, highly usable content repositories for a system of record, like an as-built of uh, a cash or account. the 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 most recent copy of uh, uh, your payroll policies or HR policies. Exactly and, right. And so SharePoint is what it's always really intended to, but but not being forced into doing what it never did well, which is things like things with UNC protocols, large files. Uh, but is about that kind of structured environment um, that that is authoritative content that you could have created as a draft in OneDrive. Um, worked on in blob storage and pulled over so it's mm -hmm. at a point of record. Or, and I think there's a good segue to That's Teams. Uh, with Teams, an example I always give is, so you're switching PPOs from Paychex to ADP. Well, there's a lot of back and forth internal to the HR department. This is a great place to run those conversations and to build draft content that once it's all said and done, again, would end up in SharePoint. So anything you would add to the Teams use? Right. And the other thing about Teams is Teams has a lot of applicability as sort of a hybrid of SharePoint Online and OneDrive. It's really those two concepts put together into one area. And you also have to consider the sort of outlook um, effect as well. It's a great place to store conversations and it's a great place to store the, the content collateral that's aligned to those conversations before it becomes official or before it needs to be distributed to its target audience. And in a case like where you're putting together an HR policy, all of that internal traffic is secured inside of that one team. So you can have people working on those files together that are part of a smaller group and it doesn't create all of this, um, doesn't create all of this noise email traffic, that sort of thing that you might otherwise have to go back and refer via email. It doesn't get lost. You know where it is. It has a place. You create a team. The team is called Human Resources Department. And they have a channel called Quarterly Updates to EPO Policies. Right. And so you have a structure. And then that and, becomes and a place. And it addresses what you know. Going back to what SharePoint didn't do well uh, back in the days, because uh, you and I have been working for 15 years in uh, uh, information architecture space, um, you would have these massive number of subsites that nobody could maintain, and those subsites were in fact one-offs for a quarter for an initiative. And Teams further declutter SharePoint um, from doing what it doesn't do well. It, SharePoint is about structured communication, classically within the context of an intranet. Um, but what did you do with all those side conversations before? And were people doing it in Skype and off their file system? Teams is that unified interface that allows you to have a targeted conversation uh, and further declutter SharePoint. Fair? Well, and that's really the intention of the platform is to take what it never really did well, which was a moderated forum, right. and have a moderated forum with document management that's in SharePoint, because when you boot up a team, you get a document library that's actually sitting in a SharePoint site, right? So you get all the power of that with the inline, you know, discussion. Yeah, it's like the Office 365 stack brought together within the context of a specific initiative. Its own email, its own chat, its own videos. Mm -hmm. That's uh, right. And if you want, its own file storage. Of course, you can link it back to that SharePoint site as well. It's sort of deeper conversation, mm -hmm. uh, right. but that's the other way. I've everything's looked at in line, right? Everything's in line. The the you know you can start a meeting inside of a channel in Teams, and the recording stays in that channel. You know, 
the content's actually in stream, right? And this is the whole point of this discussion is the, the file, the, the recording is in stream, which is an Azure blob storage, right? Because that's where that belongs. But this is what Microsoft is doing. They're unifying the user experience into one area and the place where the files are is becoming less important. So you have to know where the best place to put them is to be the most cost effective, to get the best user experience out of it. Governance, InfoSec, the whole bit. Governance, InfoSec, right. Like, do you need to e-discover a DVD? No, you can't because you, you're not going to, you can't crawl a binary file. So there, some of these things have very simple answers and some of them are a little bit more complicated. Well, and there are some search tools around Azure. Uh, we can pick that up on our next conversation. But um, just for now, this has been great. But the thing I'd like to pick up next time we talk, though, is, all right, so you've made all the right decisions based upon governance, cost, file type. Um, and so, of course, the big thing, though, is end users don't care. They should never care as to where this stuff is stored. What they That's care right. about is the value of that content and how they have to interact with it. So next time we speak, uh, let's talk about how we do that. Uh, we're big uh, proponents of Nintex. We've been working with that firm forever. And uh, Nintex has some unique qualities, I think, that would really bring to bear uh, quite a bit of it. Well, I hope you uh, enjoyed today's podcast. We're going to be doing a number of these. In our next conversation, we're going to pick up from what we spoke of today and then shift focus to the user experience. Now that you know what repositories you want to use within your institution, how do you deliver that content in a way that drives value to the business and most importantly, has a meaningful user experience to drive that adoption in the context of a business objective? Hope to hear from you then. Thank you, everybody. This is Joe Gigrich. Talk to you next time.